seven. Um, also, my name is also Eric Finley, for those of you who may know me on the, another professional level. But um, I'm a local artist, as Cody already told you. Um, street artist, graffiti artist, illustrator, uh, designer, things like that. Um, some of my work um, you've probably seen around town, such as these murals that I'm showing you now. This is a mural that's over on Glass Street. Some of you may have seen it, you may have not. Um, if you haven't, go over to East Chattanooga, take a ride up Glass Street, look at the artwork over there, it's really cool. Um, this is over on Dodds Avenue, not too far from here. Um, if you've seen these, have, have any of you seen my work? Raise your hand if you're familiar with my work, if you already have, okay, you have some sort of a reference as to who I am and what I do. Okay, so for those of you who don't, I can be sort of a mysterious character, but I'm trying to kind of step out of that and be more, you know, public and, and you know, what do you call it? Uh, I can't speak right now. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to talk to you today about magic, okay? Now, magic, I think, is a good topic for me um, specifically because it has a lot of different meanings. Um, but before I go into the topic, let me say one thing. I know you guys are probably used to just sitting here listening to people talk, and I'm not really good at just standing in front of crowds and just talking and blah, 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 blah. So please, if I say something that like strikes a chord with you or you can relate to and you wanna chime in or say something to me about what I'm speaking on, please do. Let's have a conversation, let's engage because you know I'm feeling kinda awkward just standing up here like, oh, I'm seven, I paint murals, uh. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so anyway, these are, these are some of my pieces. You know what I do, you've seen them. And I'm gonna to talk to you about magic. Now, magic, um, raise your hand if you believe in magic. If you have any sort of a inkling of energy in your body, you say, I believe in magic, raise your hand, raise your hand, come on. Raise your hand if you believe in magic, come on. I believe in magic. <laughs> Okay, so not very many people in this crowd believe in magic. Okay, that's very interesting. I believe in magic personally. Um, the reason I believe in magic is because um, I have my own definitions for what magic is. So I wanna briefly hit on three things that magic is for me, or how I define magic. And then I'm gonna kinda elaborate on those three things and please, Come in and talk to me if you, if you can. <laughs> um, so first thing, number one, for me, um, mind over matter is magic, okay? That's the first point. Second point, imagination is magic, okay? Third point, creativity is magic. Am I standing in the right area? It's like the voice, the mic keeps changing, the speaker keeps changing. Um, so anyway, when I, when I say mind over matter, okay, is magic. I'm not talking about, you know, pulling a rabbit out the hat type trick or, you know, trying to escape with handcuffs under 10 feet of water like Houdini or whatever. What I mean by mind over matter is basically being able to affect or create your reality using the power of your imagination. Um, basically, manifesting your reality based on your imagination or, or what you want to create. Everything in creation starts with an idea, correct? Everybody agree with that? I mean, in order to build this building, somebody had to have an idea, hey, I want to make some architectural plans and we're going to build this structure and blah, 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 blah. It started out as an idea. So in you know, a certain perspective, that's mind over matter because they said, hey, I have, this, I have this idea that started out in my mind. We're going to create this structure. And they created it, and now it's manifested in this third dimensional reality that we're all experiencing right now. So um, with that said, in my experience dealing with magic, being that I am magic, um, <laughs> like I always sought to like, you know, create my own reality or affect my own reality because I may not have been satisfied with where I was in life, 
And I'm going to use where I was working as an example, previous to becoming a professional artist full time. Um, I actually used to be a middle school teacher, and I think I'm doing this in reverse. I was supposed to tell you guys a lot about myself initially and then go into the magic thing, but it's kind of happening in reverse, so just bear with me. Um, I, was, I, I taught middle school for like seven years um, at Delwood Middle School. I did not teach art, I taught computer technology. And um, that was probably the most stressful job I've ever had in my life, the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life. Stressful to the point where it caused me physical pain, you know what I mean? Just like dealing with what I was dealing with on a daily basis. So it got to a point where I was in the classroom and I was like, okay, this cannot be my reality. This is not real, this cannot be real what I'm sitting here observing and witnessing every day in the classroom. So to make a long story short, I came to a point where I decided I did no longer want to be involved in that reality. I wanted to change my world. I wanted to be in a place where I was happy, in a place where I was content, and I was doing something that I was passionate about. Well, anybody that knows me knows that I'm an artist. I'm very passionate about creating artwork or painting murals or whatever I decide to do. So I decided in my mind at that point in time that no longer did I want that for myself and that I was going to create a new world for myself. And so I decided to use my creativity and my imagination to change my, my whole circumstance. And I did that through my art and just by approaching everything that I was doing from a more strategic and creative standpoint. Um, so when I say imagination is magic, if you use your imagination, you basically can create anything you want to create, whether it be you know, something tangible and physical, whether it be um, you know, a circumstance, a situation, or just a whole you know, way of life, basically. So that's basically what I started doing, is using my imagination to create a new reality for myself. Um, and I did it through my artwork. And I don't think I initially started out with intent on doing that because you know, while I was teaching, I was still painting graffiti and painting murals. I've been an artist my whole life, but I did not know that my life was gonna take the path that it took with the arts and creating murals and things like that. So um, that was magic for me. Like me standing here talking to you guys right now, you may not believe in magic, this is magic right here. Like for real, for real. So basically, um, I believe in magic from that standpoint, just because I know how to use my creativity and my imagination to fuel, you know, the magic of my reality. Um, you guys are quiet, too. <laughs> what I'm saying. Okay, so creativity is magic. Um, man, thank you, yes. So what other city? No, this is not, okay, everything I'm showing you right here is, is all in Chattanooga. I didn't talk about this before, but I actually spent some time in Atlanta after graduating high school. I'm a Chattanooga native, born and raised. Yeah, yeah, Chattanooga, Chattanooga. No, uh, Chattanooga, no. Okay, so like when I left high school, I went to Atlanta, went to art school, um, stayed in Atlanta for 10 years. That's actually where I started doing graffiti and street art. Um, and I really didn't know that it was going to evolve into what I'm doing now. I had no idea. It was basically just I'm running around the street tagging my name on any and everything I could get my hands on, you know. And it was more so for, um, I don't know, more or less acknowledgement that I was, that I existed, you know. It was, it was something to let me, to tell me that, okay, you're, you, you matter, you exist, you know what I'm saying? So granted, it was like, from the outside looking in, you know, I'm running around here vandalizing people's property. For me, it was like a confidence builder. It was like, hey, because after a while, even though it wasn't very much art involved, over the course of time, people began to notice the name and recognize the name. And so I would go places and would hear people knowing about the name. And they're like, oh, who's seven? Who's seven? And I was like, huh. Like, that's kind of kind of catching on. So that kind of built confidence for me, so I kind of just was doing it basically out of strict ego, like a strict ego builder, strict ego boost. And over time, my skills kind of progressed and evolved, and 
you know, things changed. But um, I think I started going on a tangent just now, and I'm losing my train of thought. So, oh, the Atlanta thing. So, yeah, so I stayed in Atlanta for like 10 years, and then I went to Miami. So then I came back to Chattanooga um, in 2004. Been back here ever since. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Walking out of the classroom? <laughs> okay, I didn't just walk out of the classroom. I kind of floated out of the classroom. Oh, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Um, the step was the first step was just deciding in my mind that I didn't, I no longer wanted that for myself. You know, I I could not see myself staying in that position for much longer. And that I knew that if I stayed there, that there was no way that I would be able to realize my true passion or seeing that materialize. So really it just started with the decision. And, and it was like, like a light switch, you know, it was instant. It was like, okay, this is it. And it was like sink or swim, really. And it hasn't always been easy because it actually started out very difficult. But the good thing was over time, even before I stopped teaching, I had started doing the mural thing. So I guess I started, I was on the radar, you know, becoming on the radar for a little while. And, you know, people started noticing things. So I started getting little commissions here and there. And I noticed that started to build. So I was like, maybe if I take a different approach to this, I can turn this into something more, you know, than just me painting on someone's random wall, you know. And it, it happened, you know, and it kind of, as I saw it developing, I was like, okay, I just started, you know, building on it and it really started to manifest, you know. And so that's kind of what I'm saying to you right now about the whole magic thing, mind over matter. Like my my first initial step with this whole street art movement was like just seeing a wall, not knowing who it belonged to, you know, um, and was like just deciding, okay, I'm gonna take that wall, I'm gonna paint a mural on it, I'm gonna make it legal. I'm gonna make everybody love it, and then that's gonna allow me to get more and more and more from that point. And that's what I thought that I was gonna do. I didn't know if it was gonna work, but that's what I did. I took the wall, almost got arrested. Um, <laughs> they let me finish painting it. Everybody loved it. Came back two years later, painted another one. Everybody loved it. Two years later, painted another one. Everybody, oh God. So, you know, <laughs> then I started getting little, you know, projects here and there. And then I was like, wow, this really is it's happening, you know. And so I was kind of amazed by it, really, more than anything. And um, so I was just like, yeah, I know, I see how this works now. So, you know, on a slightly unrelated note, in later, latter years, I started, you know, getting into some spiritual studies and things like that about manifesting reality and things like that and um, just using your mind to change your circumstances. And so it all kind of reconnected to what I was doing by instinct, you know, just starting with this whole, you know, movement is trying to make a living doing this, basically. Um, so did I touch on everything I was trying to say? Um, Where was that first piece? It was on Central Avenue, Central and like Macaulay, close to Macaulay. If, if you guys know that piece at all, or know any of my work, there was a lady with a Polaroid camera on Central and, and Macaulay with like a little seven graffiti piece. Two pieces before that, there was just a rose. Um, I, anybody know about the rose? One person, no, two people. Anybody else know about the rose? The rose is important. Three people, the roses started this whole thing. Okay, so. The rose was the first piece that I painted, and um, it was just a piece I painted for my mother for Mother's Day. Um, and it was something I thought I could get away with painting illegally, even though I was pretending to paint illegally. So I know that sounds crazy. I literally just found the walls, just that wall. I was like, okay, I don't know who this wall belongs to. I want to paint on it and see if I can get away with it. Halfway through painting it, cops showed up. You know, somebody called the cops. They was trying to put me in cuffs the whole nine. 
I told them what I was doing, explained it. They looked at the sketch. They was like, okay, it's, no, it's not game related. We'll let you finish it. I finished it. Everybody loved it. And it just kind of like, because they allowed me to finish it, that was kind of like an unspoken um, permission to continue to paint there at that one spot. So I just kind of continued to paint at that one spot over and over until it became known that I was the one at least that I was doing it, you know. And so I was able to get other spots from people's familiarity with that one, you know. And that's kind of how it started, really, as far as being legal, painting legally and everything. Yes. The role of ego in a, in a successful artist? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, really, I really can't speak on the role of an ego because honestly, I'm kind of trying to get away from that whole ego perspective um, just because the movement that I'm kind of involved in is more community driven or culturally it involves other artists. It's not just like, Oh, I'm just this one street artist trying to paint as many murals as I can. It's really more like I'm an artist, but I like, I like to see other people's art as well. I appreciate art as well. So I would love to see other muralists doing exactly what I'm doing in the same community. And we could do it in a sort of a um, collaborative fashion. So um, ego doesn't necessarily have a proper place in that realm, but if you just change it and flip it to a strictly graffiti standpoint, with, which most of you may not know much about the graffiti culture, but that's primarily ego driven. It's primarily all about ego, as a matter of fact. It's like when you see people writing their names around places and just tagging their names, it's because they want to be seen or recognized because for the simple reason, they just want to be recognized. That's it. You know, it may not be about their skill level. It may not be about anything other than they want you to know their name. That's it. So they're going to write it as many places as they can so they make sure that you see it. And that may be the only recognition they get, but that's, that's the core of it. That's the ego thing. And then it kind of you know, evolves from there as you become better at what you're doing. Like if you're starting to paint wild style graffiti pieces of your name trying to compete with another artist that's painting a wild style piece of, with his name, it's like a competition between the artists who can paint the best or most stylish piece. So in that aspect, it's all about ego, but that's strictly the graffiti culture, not per se street art, the street art culture. Those are two different things. A lot of people don't really understand that. Yes. This particular, like this piece, yeah. um, pretty much everything I do starts with a sketch or, or an idea and then a sketch. Um, so that particular piece that you're looking at now, um, that was done during my artist in residence with the Glass House Collective. And um, the subject matter of the piece, the, the white crane, is something that's significant to me. So. I just wanted to include that in the piece as just something general that I think that anybody could appreciate regardless of whether or not you knew the meaning of it. And it was kind of a community sponsored sort of a project. So my reasoning for doing that design specifically was just I wanted to do something that could be appreciated by everyone but also be seen as contemporary modern street art, graffiti slash influence, you know, all that mixed into one, but still be like, yo, this is like the best thing you've ever seen, like locally. I mean, that's the ego coming out, excuse me. Um, <laughs> no, I do have an ego, don't get it twisted. I, I'm trying to be humble, like very humble these days because you know, it's all good with the universe, being grateful and all that, but yes, I do have an ego. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question, it was just a sketch um, and I, I wanted to incorporate some geometric shapes and angles and I really just threw it all together in a comp and presented it and they were like, hey, we love it. I was like, all right, great, I'm gonna paint it. 
but for something else, it may have been totally different. Like, oh yeah, that's the piece that everybody was mad at me when I painted over it. Like this was the piece on Central Avenue. Have I gone over my time limit or anything? Okay, so this piece was on Central Avenue um, in Macaulay, and it lasted for <clears throat> maybe two or three years. Funny thing is when I paint my murals in certain communities, um, the people that live in the community kind of take on an ownership of the piece. <laughs> they become attached to it. And uh, a lot of times they don't know who painted the piece. So when I go back to these spots and like try to cover them up or paint over them, like I get approached by people <laughs> like aggressively, <laughs> like, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, freaking out. Like, why are you covering this piece? So like, when I'm just covering this piece up, this guy came up and tried to fight me. Like literally, that's my piece. You're painting over it. What are you doing? Just freaking out. I was like, calm down, man. Calm down. I'm like, I'm the artist. I want to paint something new. It's gonna be cool. You know, it's all good. But like, like people really like get attached to this kind of stuff. So, at that point, I realized something that um, what I was doing was more than just creating art. Um, that I am actually interacting with the community on an energetic level. And what I mean by that is um, everybody agrees that art contains energy, right? And if you don't, then I'm telling you it does, okay? <laughs> art is very energetic. I mean, you, you, when you look at art, whether you appreciate it or not, I mean, sometimes or most of the time you look at it, you have some sort of reaction to it, right? Whether it's an emotional reaction, you like it, you don't like it, it's pretty, it's ugly, I don't understand it, whatever, you know what I'm saying? You have some sort of a reaction, that's, that's energy, that's, a, that's an energetic exchange. So when you see a piece and you know, it inspires you or you know, it causes you to think a certain way, then you know, that's, that's, an, that's an energetic interaction going on. And so I realized that I had the power to affect people, affect people energetically, affect people's lives, affect the way people view certain things, you know what I'm saying? Like people's perspectives, just by painting a picture on a wall. And uh, that's crazy to me, but I know it's true because when people come up to me and they talk to me about what I'm doing or what they've seen and how they react and respond, I'm like blown away by just by what they tell me. So I'm just like, wow, like I didn't never ma imagine that I would affect people in that way, you know. So knowing that, you know, kind of gave me the impression that, you know, it's like I have this superpower, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> got this energy and uh, I can use it to like affect people or not control people, but affect people. And uh, I think that's a cool thing. So what I, that's, that's magic. That is magic. That's the magic. That's what I'm trying to get to. OK, so yeah, the whole energetic creativity and interacting, this whole thing I'm doing right now, this is magic. What I'm doing when I paint these pictures on the wall, I am creating magic, making the magic happen. I'm magic. And you feel it, so <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Um, well, initially, when I started approaching building owners, property owners, or whatever, just to get permission to paint walls, if that's all that it was, and, and granted, I didn't, I have only gotten like one or two of those in the city. Everything else has been either commissioned or whatever the case may be. Usually, if, if I'm just getting permission and they just give me the freedom to paint, whatever. Um, the only time I'm usually given parameters, it's when it's commissioned. If I'm being paid, then I expect to have creative parameters. And I don't really mind that, per se, because if you're paying me to paint a mural on your building, 
then I kind of expect you to have something that you want to see already or an idea in your mind already. Some people don't. I love it when people give me the total creative freedom to do what I want to do. But if you're paying me, I expect that. So I don't, I don't have an issue with creating something that we can both say like, hey, okay, cool, I like that. Or if you have an idea or a concept, I can totally take your concept and just create something based on the concept that you give me that I'm still cool with because that's my mission to make it look cool, you know, kind of. Um, so it really just depends. It's like, if you're going to pay me, I don't mind you telling me what to paint. If you're not going to pay me, then don't tell me what to paint. That's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Has, uh, has your perspective changed at all um, towards other graffiti artists? Maybe the, I haven't really ever noticed many of your public pieces being defaced or bombed or whatever. But like the cult in the graffiti culture, you know, you kind of have the I paint something, somebody else may come in, they paint on top of it, and then it's kind of go back and forth. It's like this unspoken dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have a different perspective on that now for people either vandalizing or putting their art on your art, or maybe like if a building owner comes along and changes some piece because they don't like the color? Or, or something like that. You know? you, are you following me on Instagram? Uh, my first experience with some of your pieces was actually in high school, and uh, an area called Bayfield Park. Uh, it's like the Bayfield Park of Greenville. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, the whole crossover, going over thing. Okay, so the thing is, in graffiti culture, there's this thing where as, okay, if, if you tag or you write or you paint graffiti, then it's disrespectful for you, for you to cover up someone else's work or for someone to cover up your work. That's a, that's a sign of disrespect or straight diss. Um, so... In the culture that is expected, Chattanooga does not have a real graffiti scene. Granted, we have graffiti out there. The, the, there is no scene here. I'm, I'm saying this because I know this because I come from a scene in Atlanta where there is, was a major scene, was and is a major scene. So my whole graffiti career, I went you know, through this whole phase of having my stuff covered up. You expect it at some point. Basically the rules are, if you tag something, if I just scribble my name on the, on the wall and another graffiti artist comes up and he does like some bubble letters on top of my tag, then supposedly that's okay because what he did is better than what I did. But if I come back and do a full color piece like what you see right here, and then this graffiti artist just comes up and just tags something over the, side or just put something, then that's not okay. So in Chattanooga, since I've, you know, my art has evolved beyond just limit the limitations of the graffiti scene, um, it's kind of a different sort of a scenario. Number one, nobody covers my work, okay? So I don't really have that issue here. I'm not saying that from a standpoint of ego, I'm, I kind of am, but I'm not. But, <laughs> no, 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 really, I'm, I'm, I'm not because it's like my work is, is pretty well respected here in the city. For the artistic integrity. For the artistic, yeah, yeah, so nobody really, even the graffiti artists respect my work here. But if, it were, if my work was to get covered or something like that was to happen to it, if it wasn't a blatant, just flat out disrespect, act of disrespect, then I wouldn't, it wouldn't affect me in a negative way per se because it's like I'm kind of used to that, you know? But if it's something that I just like, you know, spent like, you know, a week or two on and, you know, I got paid for it, and it's like a really big deal, portfolio piece, and then someone decides they want to come up and just change the colors without consulting me or whatever the case, you know, then there, there could be some, you know, ruffle feathers or something involved. <laughs> Yeah. You talked about sort of the, the way that communities sort of 
latch on to the pieces and it sort of becomes theirs. And I know you talked about sort of moving from graffiti or ego to something that's more community driven. How do you see your work and work like yours? How does it affect the community? What what sort of value does it bring? It seems like a lot of times these these pieces in this kind of street art is in hmm. parts of town that they're they're lacking some sort of ownership and pride. And you, you feel like that gives the neighborhood something to sort of feel proud about. Well, I'm gonna put it to you like this, and this is real, and you may or may not notice or believe in this trend, but if you don't, you will soon, because you'll see it. Um, all trends follow the artists, all trends, whether it be fashion, you know, design, what, I mean, whatever, in all industries, I mean, all industries follow the arts, the trends in art. Now, what happens with, you know, street art in a lot of these other major cities and, and especially the cities that are using these, uh, this movement as a tool to kind of revamp their whole community or whatever, sometimes you have these undesirable parts of the community where they allow these artists to come in and paint and do whatever they want to do. And then, you know, the artists make these areas cool and more acceptable or desirable or interesting. And then people come in and they, you know, maybe buy the property or, or try to, you know, redevelop, you know, the area and raise the property value and all this stuff following this whole art artist movement. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a trend that, that's happening around the world. Street art right now is like a major moving force for that sort of a developmental trend. Um, they're, they're trying to do that in, in East Chattanooga right now, in a way. Um, but if you go to like places like Atlanta or places where there's a very large street art scene that's very developed, and you've seen how it's changed from where these areas before the street art existed there, how they were and how they are now after the whole street art movement has, you know, then it's just like, it's common knowledge. It's like, you know, it's, it, it raises the value or the perspective of the quality of life in that part of town or that area, you know, and that just creates an interest for investors to come in and find ways to, you know, recreate it and make money and do whatever they want to do with it. But a lot of times, at the end of that, the artists are kind of left out in the end after the, all the progress has been made, you know? They use the art and the artists, and then they kind of just kind of brush them to the side a little bit. I've seen that happen. Yeah. I got a question about the, the city. Um, a buddy of mine owns the, the building with Frazier that has Nikola Tesla and Steve Jobs. And he said that the city mm -hmm. Sign laws. Right. And um, so my question would be, you know, also thinking about you know, the Cox Paper thing and all that stuff that happened in the news where the city claimed it's a billboard. And, you know, do you get hassle from the city? I personally don't, but that's because I'm not the property owner, and the city doesn't like the people that will have issues with that don't know how to reach me per se. I don't know if they've had, if the you know, property owners have had issues, but what, to my understanding, if, you, if you're painting a piece of artwork and it doesn't contain any text or advertisement of any sort, then technically that's supposed to be okay according to the city sign laws, but I guess if it's a sign for a business or some sort of advertisement, then you know, there's limitations or fees that you have to pay and stuff like that. I don't, I don't encounter that at all, personally, but I don't have to as of yet. So, yes. Sometimes, um, if I don't have a specific idea already and a wall becomes available to me or someone says, hey, I have this wall, you know, I want you to paint something on it, what, what can you do? And I don't have an idea, then I may look at the wall and based on the shape of it, 
try and come up with something that would fit the shape, or I may already have an idea in my head that I've just been wanting to paint for a long time, like that would look cool right here, you know, or something like that. So it really just kind of depends, you know. Judge? Yes. Hey man, I just want to say thank you uh, for the rose that started this whole thing. Yeah. Because I live in the Portland area, and uh, before that area of Cancun just got started, it's kind of an interesting moment on that corner, and your rose blew my mind, and I was like, this thing's going to get destroyed, and it, just, it stayed, and it was beautiful. Yeah, and yeah. And, and this At least maybe seven, eight years. So, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, y'all give seven a round of applause.